Hello and welcome infinite banking practitioners, policy holders, high cash value life insurance, individuals, infinite banking advocates. Welcome. My name is Enzo Rodriguez, your personal finance geek of the 21st century. And in this video, we're going to be discussing what company do I go with for infinite banking? I did a video a while back talking about this very same question and I'm just making an updated video going over really some of the same stuff we went over maybe just adding a couple more things to it so that you the prospect the customer the interested client looking into high cash value life insurance infinite banking you want to make the right decision I've laid out a little blueprint for me if I was brand new to the concept and I had someone in my corner that can just tell me, here are the things you need to look for, right? Here are the things you need to have before moving forward so that when you're having a conversation with that insurance agent, you're coming to the table very prepared rather than the agent selling you infinite banking. It's their job to sell you infinite banking. It's their job to illustrate a policy for you. It is also your job to come to the table prepared just like you would when you go to buy a car. When you step on the car dealership, there's tons of cars available for sale, but there's only one that you're gonna be leaving with. So how do you best prepare yourself before you buy that car? Well, you look at the make and models of vehicles, you look at price points, you look at the financing, the interest rate, the terms and agreements, the bells and whistles, right? All of those things, you're, you're coming to the dealership with a car in mind, with a color in mind, with the model in mind. It's the car salesman's job to sell that idea that you had to you, um, and then we make that match, right? So let's take a look at the board in terms of what companies are available for infinite banking, which ones are most ideal, and what are what is the blueprint? For us to move forward with all right so let's begin on my left here are all of the mutual life insurance companies that i know of that i have interacted with with another licensed life insurance agent i'm also licensed myself and i've received a ton of training over the last three four years and during that time i've had the pleasure and privilege to actually collaborate with other licensed life insurance agents you can look at my uh, playlist called youtube collaborations you'll see a ton of uh, agents i've collaborated with in the past i've been able to have intelligence behind the scenes behind the scenes information that i'm now you know able to reveal to you in such a way that provides transparency at the end of the day i want to help you make the best decision whether you decide to work directly with me in terms of getting an infinite banking policy, one of my competitors, one of the agents that I've collaborated with, IBC Global, right? I just wanna help you make the best decision, right? So I will say full transparency, out of this entire list, I have a policy personally with Mass Mutual and one with Guardian. I have no policies anywhere else. Um, I have only full transparency, I have only written policies for clients with mass mutual and guardian no other company i'm open-minded okay i stay open-minded i i talk with other agents to gain some insight to see which other companies are doing what but for the last three four years all of my clients either have a mass mutual or guardian policy and i tend to sell what i own is usually the route that i take with that being said i only gathered one piece of data uh, for all of these companies, which is the amount of assets that are under management for each and every one of these companies. These numbers are either 2021 or 2020. Some of the companies are 2020 because they have not posted their 2021 annual report. Even though we're in 2022, it's now April, middle of April that I'm recording this video. I believe it was out of this entire list. I think it was Lafayette and maybe Mutual of Omaha that did not post their 2021 annual report, might be mistaken. And uh, for full transparency, I think Mutual of Omaha, and I know for sure Mutual Trust are stock companies. 
Okay, the only reason why I have them on the list because I'm taking from uh, a video I did back then where I, I put mutual trust. So I think at one point they were mutual because it says mutual, but as of late or as, of, as of, I don't know how many years now, they are no longer a mutual life insurance company. They're a stock. If I'm wrong, correct me. Uh, same with Mutual Omaha. I think they're in the process of switching from mutual to a stock, okay? So this is just a list, okay? These are all the companies that I know other agents have sold policies with that I've spoken to. Other uh, life insurance players that do infinite banking have used these companies. These are the most popular ones that I've seen in the space of infinite banking, okay? I have a video, I think one or two, where I talk about all the infinite banking players. When players, I mean the gurus, the content creators, licensed insurance agents that have popularity, that have credibility, that have an entire system, right? And I lay out an entire list. Uh, so you can check out that video. The only person I think I'm missing on that list was Life 180, a guy named Chris but um, I actually had the pleasure of speaking with him recently. Really nice guy. He does not write policies personally, I, I believe. He literally just critiques the whole industry, right? And he does a lot of exposing videos of insurance agents on, on the IUL side. So he's very, very, very critical, which is, a, which is great. You need people like that who are critical of the concept. Um, it's not like he doesn't agree with IBC. He absolutely 100% agrees with infinite banking, he practices it himself, but he's also very critique. And I like to do that as well. It's like, I like to be very critique with these concepts, especially velocity banking. You know, I'm the first to tell you that velocity banking doesn't work for everyone. I'm the first to tell you that infinite banking doesn't work for everyone. It all has to do with positioning. What's the most effective thing that I can do in my cash flow, And I move forward from there. So with that, let's go back to the board. Here's my little blueprint in terms of the questions and answers that you need to get before you put a policy in place with that particular agent, okay? This is a must, do not overlook this, right? So if you're watching this video and you do not have a life insurance policy in place, this is the best video to watch, right? Because it's not gonna tell you which company to go to, it's not gonna tell you which person to go with, rather it's gonna give you a blueprint on how to pick and how to choose and how to evaluate. Because at the end of the day, you could go with say the best company on here on this list, whichever one that may be. Let's say it's New York Life because they got the highest number of um, assets under management. So let's just say, playing a game here, hypothetical, New York Life is the best company for infinite banking. Let's just say that. Well, naturally you're like, all right, well, I'll just go with that one. But you could have the best company but the worst agent. You could have the best company, but an illiterate agent, someone that is not uh, uh, understanding, they do not comprehend infinite banking, so therefore they do not know how to design a policy for you. So here's the thing, infinite banking concept is a concept, it's an idea, it's not a product, right? not it's not a product so i can't call new york life speak to a customer service rep or anyone in the department and say i need an infinite banking policy it that's not how that works so you have to understand same thing with velocity banking you can't go to bank of america wells fargo chase jp morgan and say i want to do velocity banking to pay off all my debt show me how to do that that, that doesn't exist velocity banking is a concept, it's an idea, it's a philosophy, it's a way of doing things with your finances, okay? So let me be perfectly clear that when you are practicing or looking to practice, looking to exercise the infinite banking concept into your financial goals and your financial journey to financial freedom, the product is either a WLI, a whole life insurance contract, and arguably an index universal life insurance contract. My personal opinion, infinite banking concept specifically has to do with WLI, whole life insurance. But many gurus, other 
individuals on YouTube intertwine it and call it the same thing, that infinite banking is a whole life and or an index universal life insurance contract. You could call any one of these companies and say, I need a whole life insurance policy. I need an index universal life insurance policy. And they can say, great, I'll help you. I'll connect you to an agent. Boom, done. But when we're talking infinite banking, it's a totally different request, right? And there is many different concepts and ideas within the main concept. Just like looking at all the different Christian denominations, right? In all of the Christian denominations, there's only one God, but there's 45,000 different types of Christians. How, how can that be? <laughs> right? Beats me. But, you know, we're human, right? So that's just a little example of the difference. Concept, many, many ideas and concepts within it. Really only two products you end up with. You're either going to end up with a whole life insurance contract or an index universal life insurance contract. And then within these two, there's probably a million different ways that you can design a whole life insurance contract and an index universal life insurance contract. A million different ways. Just like there's a million different options for you to buy a car, but you're only gonna end up with one or many, depending on what you can afford, right? So are we clear on that? Cool, let's go to the blueprint. First things first, this is what's gonna help you narrow from the million down to five different options, maybe three to five, right? And it's gonna help you keep narrowing, narrowing, narrowing to the one decision that you make. First, must be a mutual life insurance company, okay? So that's gonna eliminate probably maybe 30, 40, 50% of companies, life insurance companies out there, right? So just eliminate a bunch. Must be a mutual life insurance company. What does that mean? That means that the life insurance company has no external owners. It's the owner, founder of the company, and then you are a policy owner, you're a policy holder, so all profits are shared between the owner, the employees, is the people who have um, equity in, in the company, and then the policy holders, okay? If it's a stock company, that means that company is listed on the stock market, I can buy shares of that company without owning a life insurance policy, and I can receive dividends, I can receive income, right, through the stocks that I own. So that means if I get an infinite banking policy with a stock company, my chances of receiving the dividends lessen because I have to share it with more people. I have to share it with the stockholders, the owner, and the policyholders. Versus a mutual company, it's just owner, policyholders, policy owners, okay? So first, second question you're gonna ask the agent when they give you an illustration, whether it's a WLI or an IUL, right? You say, what is the split, okay? They might say, what do you mean, okay? What you mean is, how much of my dollars is going towards premium and cost, and how much of my dollars is going to cash value? I wanna know the percentage split, okay? Here are the examples of the most popular split designs that are in the marketplace today. Without even asking, without even bringing it up, the agent will fall somewhere in between this split design. Meaning, if you plan on putting in 50,000 into a policy, right? If it's a 90-10, very simple. Five grand goes to premium, right? Then there's gonna be some other cost in addition to the premium. There's term, there's a PUA expense, and then there's sales load charges in the first one or two years, if I'm not mistaken, right? If it's an 80-20, right? Same thing, the number just goes up and up, right? So if let's say uh, 50,000 times 40%, that's 20 grand, right? So you can have person A and person B both putting in the same amount of money, but having a completely different cost margin, right? One has a cost of five grand in terms of the base premium, other person has 20 grand, okay? And this will be argued till the end of times, 
as to which one is better. I have played the game of arguing back and forth as to which one is better. But now after a few years, just a few years in the business, I have settled to just provide the facts and then allow the client to make the decision as to which direction they want to go. What really got me to this point, which is very interesting, was I actually had a client or have, I have a client, they're living, right? Where they were looking to pay in $100,000 into a policy. And I personally stay in this range in terms of my splits uh, between 90-10 and 75-25. So not 70-30, but 75-25 to 90-10, meaning 90% of the money is going to cash value. Cash value is the most interesting component that the client is most interested in because that is what the client is going to be using, right? So that is why it is, that is what's most interesting to them, not the death benefit. So 90% is going to cash, 10% is going to base premium, cost of insurance, or 25% being the highest going to base premium and 75% going to cash, okay? That has been my range and I haven't deviated from that position. I personally have not been able to make mathematical sense of going any higher than 75, 25. It, it just hasn't hit me yet. Um, there's other agents that I respect that, that do it and by all means. So what really helped me come to the conclusion of instead of arguing back and forth is back to my story. I have a client looking to put in a hundred grand into a policy. I showed them a 90-10. I showed them a bunch of different types of 90-10 designs. They also were talking with a competitor, right? And just for full transparency, I won't name the competitor. Uh, I don't want any beef, right? I like to keep things cordial. Hey, if you want, ever want to talk to me, cool. You want to do a collaboration? Cool then the audience will know who you are. But in the meantime, I just wanna focus on the, the facts of the matter. Client went to a competitor and they were shown in the neighborhood of a 60-40 design and they wanted that one more. And I was explaining to the client, I said, well, you're gonna have over a 50%, roughly a 50% net loss when you put the 100 grand in because $40,000 is going to cost that's the base premium then you're going to have a term rider expense charge and then you're going to have a pua expense charge so your net cash value day one is going to be maybe 50 plus thousand or so right you're you're not going to have nowhere near the 100 grand that you started with so that limits your ability to borrow cash to go earn in a different location right and so I was going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with the client, showing them different designs, showing them this, internal rate of returns, guarantees. And I ended up losing that client to this particular design. And I'll actually show you the design for full transparency without showing any names or anything like that. But uh, here's the design. This is what they ended up going with, paying in 116,539 a year. The base premium is $28,750. So if there's anything that I did do right, was I actually got the competitor to actually reduce the split a little bit. So you notice it's not a 60-40 anymore, where it would have been 40,000 being the base premium. Then I think it, at one point it was like 35% or 33% or something like that. So. You can see here, um, if they were to pay in the full 116, 539, what is that? I think it was 25%. So it was about a 24% split, right? So it's right around 75, 25 split, okay? If we're just looking at the 116, 539 in comparison to the base premium of 28,750. Now, what, what fascinates me is the limits that this client has, but they were still willing to move forward with it. So that was a learning experience for me. So I'm like, shoot, it really don't matter what I say, it, what does the client want? 
right? If I would have just listened to the client in this particular situation, I would have retained them as a client rather than sell them a different philosophy or different idea. I should have just leaned into what, what they wanted. That's what they want. So that's been my position as of late is just whenever I talk to someone and the client says, I want a 60, 40 design. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Then I want a 70, 30. I want an 80, 20. I want a 90, 10. So, okay. No problem. Here's what it looks like. Would you like to see any other comparisons? Would you like to see any other designs? If they say yes, so okay, here you go. Just providing everything you need, right? That's been my approach, just serving the needs of the customer. So they're able to put in 116,539, but they can only do that for seven years, right? Then in years eight and nine, it goes down to 114,199. And then by year 10, they can only pay in a max of $28,750. And they can continue to pay in that amount all the way to age 78. So they start at age 49 and they can fund all the way to age 78. And if you look at the cumulative premium column, the total max amount of dollars over this 30 year period, they can only pay in 1,647,000 $921, right? Seems like a lot of money, but the reality is the simple facts is that you can actually design the policy to put in the same amount of dollars, the same amount of time, but for less costs, less fees, and actually have a higher cash value coming out, right? How do you do that, Denzel? Well, it has to do with the split and it has to do with the design of the policy. Okay. There are a few things, very few things in terms of design that you can add inside of a policy to optimize the cash value. One of those main things is something called PUA, right? Which is mentioned down here. It's a cost, but it's also a rider called paid up additions, AKA cash value. Paid up additions is a rider that allows your cash, your, your dollars going into the policy to immediately show up in cash value. And then that money starts to grow forever and ever, right? So when I look at the person's numbers, I actually compared it to my own policies that I have and come to find out I can actually put in more money than them and I'm paying way less in cost. So in my head, whoever pays in more money technically is the winner and whoever does it for less costs is more efficient, right? So they've got a cost of 28,750, right? So if we were to do the math, 28,750 times 30 years, their cost, just looking at base premium, not term rider costs and PUA costs, their cost is 862,500, right? I was showing them policy designs, same exact thing, where say, look, we could pay in a hundred thousand dollars, right? That was what they were looking for, hundred thousand for the thirty years, and you can have your base premium in between ten thousand to twenty-five thousand range, right? And by paying, by having the ability paying a hundred thousand, they can do it over a longer period of time and not be prevented. So hundred thousand times 30 years is $3 million. And so let's use the highest number, 25,000 times 30 years is 750 K. So my cost is $162,500 cheaper just off premiums alone and $3 million minus 1.647. 921 million, I'm able to put in 1.3 million more dollars than them. Same age, same funding, well, actually not the same funding, but same age, same funding amount, but I'm able to put in more of the same funding amount. I'm able to put in more for the same funding period, 30 years. So this is 30 years, 100K, right? And this one's 30 years. Do you see the difference? 
who wins? I, I would, I mean, logically, I would think this person wins. Same policy, I could, any one of these companies, right? I think um, for, they ended up going with uh, Lafayette, right? And uh, at the time I was showing them Guardian and Mass Mutual. So in this example, the company doesn't matter. In this example, the company doesn't matter because I can do the same thing in terms of design, right? So the company doesn't matter. The dividends don't matter. The guarantees don't even matter. It's the design. Who can pay in more funds? Who can pay in more money in the same period of time? Because the reality is that these companies all are projecting relatively the same dividend rates, anywhere between four and 6%, right? And now in 2022, it's more like three to 5% because with the new MEC laws, the dividend rates have come down with all most of most, if not all the insurance companies, dividend rates have come down. But with every single company, the guaranteed rates have come down from 4% was the standard. Now it's anywhere between two and 3.75%, right? So the lowest it's dropped was a quarter, 0.25, right? So just put those to the side. Let's just say I went with the same company. Let's say Lafayette, I even did this where I even showed them a design where it was like the same company, same initial funding amount, but the ability to pay in more money, right? So that means if I went with the same company, right? If I'm, if I, I'm dealing with a client and they say, Denzel, um, I want to go with Lafayette. I like that company. Okay, cool. Denzel, I have this agent showing me to showing me a 60, 40 design. Looks great. I said, okay, yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, can I show you another? And then I show them say an 80, 20 or an 85, 15 or 90, 10 or 75, 25. And it shows not only more cash value, but I can put more money in. So if we're with the same company, earning the same dividend rate, putting in the same amount of money, what's, what's the actual difference? Cost, it, it boils down to cost. And what is another one would be the, the MEC limit. So for the same amount of dollars, I can increase the MEC limit to put in more money than the other design, right? So that's something to ponder on. That's something to think about. Coming back to the blueprint, what is the split? This is so important because if you know the split, you know where your money's going. That's very, very key. That's why you're asking the question. You're asking the question to know where your money is going the moment that policy is established. You know X percentage goes to premium, X percentage goes to PUA cost, term cost, and X percentage goes directly into the cash value. So day one, this is the amount of cash value you should have day one. And that'll help you determine what you can actually leverage day one after starting the policy within two weeks you can take a policy loan out and go put that money to work because that's where the real money is made is when you borrow from the policy and go and invest it or co-vest it if you're in the ministry right so the next thing is to ask yourself short term or long term whether you go long term or short short term that is what will influence which design you end up going with. Here's my personal opinion. If you're dealing your mindset, you want to go with a short term policy, right? Meaning you only want to pay into the policy $100,000 for 10 years. That is considered short term. That is a simple 10 pay policy, 100K, 10 years, total amount, 1 million. All right, here's the question. Which makes more financial sense for your maximum use of cash value if you're only going to pay in 100 grand for 10 years? That's it. Which split would you go with for maximum cash value potential in those 10 years? Personally, I would settle for this. 90 10. So I'd have a $10,000 base premium. And then the other 90 grand is going into PUAs from that 90 grand minus PUA expense charges minus term rider in year one, I could probably have 85% to maybe 87% or a little more show up in cash value day one versus 60, 40, 40,000 and have less than $60,000 show up day one, right? 
So if I am a real estate investor and I plan on using a portion of my hundred and acquire a property, I now have $40,000 less to work with year one. Same funding amount, same period, same company, pick any company you want, same company, but one costs you 40 grand, one, one design costs you 40 grand, the other design costs you 10 grand, right? Again, it's, it's short, so you're not even funding it that long. When you fund a policy for a long period of time, it requires more death benefit, right? Which means more expense, which means higher base premium. The higher your death benefit is, the higher the base premium has to be to supply that death benefit to avoid what is called a mech. And that's on the blueprint as well, right? So here's where I have my little range where I say, okay, if I'm dealing with a client that wants to pay in a policy for like 40 years, 50 years, 35 years, then the highest I would go personally is a 75, 25 split, right? And for 40, 50 years with certain companies such as mass mutual, you don't have to go 25%. You can actually stay in the 10% base premium because the difference is that you can have what's called a annual renewable term rider on the policy and that expense actually lessens throughout the years. But the problem can occur, or it can look like a problem, is when you go for such a long period of time, that term expense actually gets really expensive, right? This is what happens in the IUL space. They've got low base premiums, very, very, very high term expense. Problem in the IUL space, you can't turn off the term. You can only level it out, right? So it's still gonna be high. Versus in the whole life, you can have the term rider on for as long as you fund it, however your funding period is, and then it gets removed, completely gets taken off the board. So you don't even have to worry about that expense no more in your, in your later years, 70s, 80s, 90s. Then you're just dealing with base premium, right? So these are some things to ponder and think on is how long do I actually want to pay into the policy? What is my capability, my financial commitment level to actually do that? Do I see myself paying into a policy for 50 years, 40 years for my first one? Maybe not my first one, maybe my second or third policy maybe, but for your first policy, it's not too much of a commitment to do say a 10 pay or 15 or 20. You know, maybe that's a, a lesser of a commitment, less of, a, less of an obligation to, to keep, right? Because the reality is that majority of people do not have the discipline to even save money for 10 years straight. So the average Joe, average Susie, does not have the mental discipline, the mental fortitude to actually put all this together, which is why leading to my next thing is having a relationship and building rapport with that insurance agent, part of the blueprint, all right? Personally, if I'm gonna pay into a policy for 50 years, for 40 years, I would like to personally know if the agent that I'm working with if he or she is going to stay in the business for 40, 50 years. I would like to know that. I would like to have a genuine conversation with my insurance agent and ask them, hey, is this the, the career of your life? Like, is this a stepping stone? Are you gonna go into real estate investing and do some other things? Like, or is this your passion? Helping people protect their family through life insurance, helping people save money through life insurance, tax-free, building wealth tax-free. Is, is this your passion, right? And if they give you a no, well, maybe it won't alter your decision. Maybe that's not a, a worry for you, but it might be for some, and that might alter your decision. Okay, well, I don't wanna work with you then. I wanna work with someone that's, they're gonna stay in here for a long period of time. They're not going anywhere, right? So me personally, I work with many clients that are actually double my age. I'm 26 now recording this video. I plan on being in the industry well past 66 years old. So from 26 additional 40 years and even well after that, I plan on staying active in the industry. I plan on building and helping grow an entire ecosystem, an entire community of infinite banking practitioners, policy holders, financial freedom warriors, right? Kingdom citizens, like 
this is my thing. I'm not doing anything. I'm not going anywhere. This, I'm always going to be here, right? This is where I dwell. So when you're speaking with an agent, build some rapport with them because you have to talk to them every year. That's the expectation. That's the, the commitment. It's like a marriage. I got to check in with you. I gotta keep checking in with you, right? Will you do that for me, agent? Will we have yearly annual conversations with each other for the next 30, 40, 50 years till death do us part? One of us has to die for the relationship to end, right? So have that in mind. Next on the list, look at the guarantees and the internal rate of return. What does that mean? You just simply ask them to provide the guaranteed performance of the insurance illustration policy that you receive from them. So don't just look at the non-guarantees, look at the guarantees so that you know exactly what the policy will do. And on the non-guaranteed side, this is what it will likely do, okay? So when you look at the guarantees, that helps you have a, a good basis of, of where this thing is headed. And if that satisfies you, you can be assured that the non-guaranteed column is actually what your policy will do. Why is that? Because on the guaranteed side, it does not show the insurance company ever paying a dividend, like not even a penny, not even a dollar, which is highly unlikely with these companies on the list. These companies have been in business for over hundreds of years, right? I think the oldest company on here, I think might be 200 years old because we're in 2022. Mm. I think 175, 180, but, but can you imagine that? How many generations is that to be in business for over 175 years and you're worried whether this company is gonna pay a dividend or not? Like that, that's not even an issue. So when you're looking at an illustration, the non-guaranteed column is most likely what the policy will do. Like damn near close. Will there be down years? Yes, you can expect that. Will there be up years? Yes, you can expect that. But to just do zero and have that do zero consecutively, year after year after year after year, like impossible. Like I'll say it, I think that is impossible. There's no way. Not with the billions and billions of dollars that these companies do together. I mean, there's over, there's over a trillion, two, three trillion dollars that these companies generate, right? Uh, and have on their assets, on their management all together. So it's just, it's not gonna happen. Why else is it not going to happen? Because major banks and corporations store their money here for protection. So the banks aren't concerned that these companies aren't going to perform. Why? They're all in cahoots. Okay. They're, they're all together. One goes down, the whole thing goes down. And if the whole thing goes down, start reading Revelation. A matter of fact, it would have been too late. You should have been read up on a Revelation, but you waited till the last minute. Well, that's what you get. So coming back to the main thing here, look at the guarantees, internal rate of return, not hard stuff to get. Know what the loan rate is. This is just stuff to know, right? You need to know what the loan rate is. You need to know what your borrowing cost is gonna be when you go to leverage the policy. So know thy numbers, right? Know what the loan rate is. And when you receive the illustration, ask them for a no mech on guarantees, meaning Give me an illustration that shows the guarantees and I want to see in the full policy illustration that the, that the policy does not become a mech at any given time based on the guarantees alone. That helps you determine, be more comfortable that this design, whether it's a 90, 10, 80, 20, 70, 30, 60, 40, that this design will not become a mech, right? The next thing is show the mech limit. Ask for the exact mech limit number. So if I'm paying in a hundred grand a year into a policy, right? And I want the ability to pay in an extra 25,000 in any given year, I need the mech limit above 125,000 in order for you to do that. So you need to express that to the agent so that they know what to do for you. Cause what you're saying is, Hey, I have a hundred grand now and I want to pay into it for 10 years, but I want to have the ability to add in an additional 25 grand in any given year of those 10 years. So that would be 25 grand times 10. So that'd be 250 K an additional 250,000 on top of the hundred. So you would need a mech limit above 125 K in order to do that. 
and possibly a base premium of 25,000, I believe, to do that if I'm not mistaken. So that's important to be aware of. So show the MAC limits so that you know what is the max limitation that I have on this policy. So notice how when we go back to the design that I shared earlier with this particular client, they wanted to pay in 100,000. But with this design, they have the ability to go a max of 116,000, but only for seven years. And then notice how it drops. Why does it drop? It drops because there's a term writer that's limited on here that goes into policy design, right? There's, a, there's PUA writers that on this particular policy that limits the ability for this client to pay in $3 million over that 30 year period, right? The issue with this is let's say the client does want to pay in $3 million. Well, now they got to go buy a second policy in order to do that. And they might be older when they actually go and do that. So that means their cost of insurance goes up, right? So these are good things to be aware of. Next is funding flexibility. Okay, some companies limit their funding flexibilities in different ways. Other companies have more flexibility in terms of how you can fund it. For example, I'll use Mass Mutual and Guardian because I'm educated in those two a little bit more than the other ones. So with Mass Mutual, if I want to pay in $100,000 and I have a base premium of 10K, right? And let's say year one, I pay in 100. Year two, I do 100. Year three, I do 100. Year four, I have a bad year. I can only pay in 50 grand. Well, with Mass Mutual, the process is you have to let Mass Mutual know what you want to do. You need to contact your agent, right? Who you worked with, say, hey, I need to restructure this. I can only pay in five grand, uh, 50 grand. Well, with Mass Mutual, you can do that. Fill out some paperwork, nothing crazy. But if you want to pay in another 50 grand, because maybe you bounce back that year, that is subject to approval. You likely won't have an issue, but still, you're subject to approval, may require additional medical underwriting order to fulfill that order, fulfill that request, okay? Let's say you did not pay in the 50 for year four. So in year four, you only paid in 50 grand, so you missed out on 50,000 of additional funding. Let's say year five, you have your bounce back year, and you wanna pay in 150,000 in that year. We need to make sure that we're designing policies that your agent is clear that you give them a scenario. Hey, what would happen if I'm not able to pay in 100? Can I make up for it the following year? The answer is yes with Mass Mutual, right? It's just subject to approval. Medical underwriting might be required. But if you design it in such a way where that won't necessarily be the issue, then that would be good because what I have seen in the past with another agent, I have a client, they had an agent and they were putting in a significant amount of funding and the client told the agent, hey, I'm not able to pay in the, say the hundred grand. So they do 50. Well, what the agent did was they removed the term rider and they also reduced the base premium to like, say five grand, they, they chopped it in half. Well, once you do that, you can't go back to 10. If I'm not mistaken, I might be mistaken here, but that would be an ill-advised move for the agent to do. Rather, what the agent should have did, maintain the base premium, inform the client, okay, this year is a bad year, but you'll, you can have a bounce back year, so we wanna retain your ability to continue to fund the policy up to that max funding amount. We don't want to abuse that. We don't want to remove that ability. See, that's what happens in this particular account. With this design, that's what happens here with this particular person. They remove their ability to pay in over 100 grand just after 10 years, which is why I questioned why pay so much in cost to only be able to pay in so little. 
right? But I wasn't able to convey that message clearly. So I, so I lost that client in the process, right? So my hope is that over the years I mature, I get better, I do these videos, and hopefully I help someone else from making a decision without looking at all the facts, right? It's important stuff. It's a lot of money you're dealing with. I would hate for you to have buyer's remorse only three, four years later. I would hate for you to have that, okay? So funding flexibility is key. Now, if we look at Guardian, Guardian has a cool setup where you pay in, say 100 grand, your base premium's 10, year one, right? Paying 100, year two, paying 100, year three, paying 100, oh, year four, bad year, okay? Only able to pay in 50. And then six months into it, you have a bounce back, you're able to pay in another 50, no problem. You can dump money in at leisure without any additional medical underwriting, without having to fill out any additional like paperwork, right? And you can make up, and if you don't pay in the 50 that year and you wanna do it the next year, you can do that too. Very, very flexible, right? You don't lose that. So that stays the same. I don't know how it is with other insurance companies. For those who have policies that know, comment, right? Put below, what's the, what's the flexibility with a security or pen or Lafayette, right? Educate, right? When you comment, provide education for the audience, articles, facts, add to the video so that people can really learn and help make the best decision, right? The last thing is cost, right? Have the agent lay out the, the premium costs, the PUA costs, the term costs, the sales load, so you know where the money's going. That'll really, really help you. If you know where your money's going, you're not gonna be like, hey, um, you know, you told me X, Y, and Z, the money was gonna be at this amount and now it's not. You know, I was told, you know, maybe 80, 20 split, you're paying 100. So in your mind, oh, well, 20 grand goes to cost, the other 80 grand goes to cash, I should have 80 grand in cash. Logically, that's what that split kind of entails, but that's not the case, why? because there's other costs. There's PUA charges, there's term costs, sales load costs. Sales load is temporary. That falls off, so that's temporary. And term is also temporary. Um, the only thing that stays is the PUA. And that, if I'm not mistaken, is also temporary depending on how long you fund it, right? So let's say you uh, wanna pay in 100 grand for 10 to 15 years, and your base premium is 10 grand, right? So that means anything above 10 grand is PUA, paid up additions. You're overfunding above and beyond your base premium of 10 grand to get to the 100. So let's say after 10 to 15 years, you've paid in 1 million to 1.5 million total, right? Cool. Well, afterwards, you can just pay in the base premium of 10 grand for as long as you live. When you get to that point, there's no more PUA charges, you're not overfunding it anymore. There's no more term. And the sales load thing was like the first one to two years, if I'm not mistaken. After that, that falls off. The term rider would fall off after you've max funded the policy. So that reduces your cost. And if I'm not mistaken, might be mistaken here, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no more PUA because you're no longer overfunding the account. You're just paying in what's required to maintain and sustain the policy, 10K, which is just this. So this is the only thing that's permanent for the life of the policy, right? And you can also eliminate that if you want by doing what's called a reduced paid up. This is not possible with an IUL. That's another issue with IUL. You have to keep paying into it. You have to keep covering the cost and if you don't cover the cost your cash value will and if your cash value doesn't perform according to what it was illustrated to do then what can end up happening is the cost starts to eat your cash value little by little and by the time you're 90 or you die at 95 there wasn't very much death benefit left 
because the cash value got eaten up along the way with loans and etc you took income and you've got costs so imagine you're funding an IUL same amount of money as this you get to the later years 70 80 you start taking income of 100 grand 200 grand 300 grand these astronomical numbers that are displayed on these illustrations you're taking all this income year over year over year those are loans that have interest on it by the way so you're getting charged interest five percent four percent whatever the interest rate is <clears throat> that's simple interest so you can charge a loan interest on the hundreds of thousands of dollars that you're taking out of the account as income to live off of plus there's annual costs each and every year on the policy itself and you're supposed to hope and pray that you keep earning 7 15 25 you know these average rates of returns you know average rate of return is like one of the biggest lies you know you don't you don't want to rely on average rate of return because you can manipulate average rate of return for like any number you want you can make an average rate of return off of, of any number you want you can manipulate it to make it look higher but the actual net rate of return this number right here the annual internal rate of return is going to be a much smaller number and if that number is less than the percentage of your costs and the amount of money that you're withdrawing out that the money is not able to keep up with it just like what happens to 401k accounts or retirement accounts guess what the money runs out it's not ideal right so you don't want to get caught up in that mess which is why knowing your costs will determine the longevity performance of the account itself it will help you really steer in terms of okay how much money do i need to pay into this to have x amount of income come out of it right now me personally i don't use infinite banking for income i don't use it for that I use infinite banking for what it was, in my opinion, it's designed for banking. I want to replace my banking function. I want to create my own banking system. So if I have my own banking system, that implies that I never stop having a checking account until I die. I don't want to lose the checking account. I want to keep maintaining. I want to keep flowing with it. Right. So I personally do not use infinite banking for income long term rather i use infinite banking to create other income streams that provides cash flow right so one more thing that i'll add on the blueprint i just thought of is strategy i think this is very very important you need to know what strategy is your agent presenting to you are they presenting an income strategy, right? Are they presenting to you an alternative to say 401k, right? Denzel, this is an alternative to your 401k. You can grow money, you can grow your money tax-free, right? This is the rich man's Roth, right? These different things that you, that you hear. So what, how are they selling it? Because again, a million different ways you can present IBC. You can present it as an income strategy. You can present it as an alternative to a 401k, right? Or the strategy that I like is I'm solving for cash flow, right? Within the first seven to 10 years of funding my policy, however much money I decide to put in there, I want to know what cash flow streams can I create that becomes residual. I do the work one time, I get paid forever for it, right? And the money keeps coming in, the money keeps coming in. And so the money that I borrow out of the, my infinite banking policy, let's say I'm putting in, let's say I'm just saving, right? This is me sharing with you my personal numbers. I personally save six figures a year, right? So call it a hundred grand, it's a little bit more, but. We'll underestimate it call it 100 grand that's how much i save so that gets stored in life insurance policies a multitude i have two on myself one on my mom i got one on my girlfriend so four total all adding up to roughly 100 grand 
So strategy one, saving. That's it. I'm improving the performance of my savings dollars because I was saving my money in the bank, earning nothing. Now I'm saving money in my own banking system, earning four to six percent, let's say, or three to five percent. And that money compounds tax free. So I'm saving tax free. Not bad. That's very basic. Strategy number one. Strategy two protection. That's what the death benefit does. Protection, emergency fund. Because it's savings dollars, I need to make sure that money is always going to be there. So it's guaranteed to be there. It's an emergency fund. So that's second thing. And then third is cash flow. When I borrow from the hundred, let's say I borrow 50 grand in year one, I want to put the 50 in a vehicle that produces say $500 a month. So it's producing 6,000 a year, right? Maybe that could be a piece of property, piece of real estate with 50 grand. And so now that's going to pay 500 a month, six grand a year for the next 35 years. Let's say so six grand times 35, that's 210 grand. Let's say that was a piece of real estate, right? So it'll generate 210 grand of cash flow. The initial 50 that I borrowed at say three to four percent from the policy, the cash flow will pay it back in the excess. So I'll have more. So the 50 gets replenished back plus the 50 shows up in equity in the property that I, I obtained. All right. Not bad. Here's another one. Let's say I did that once. That was year one. Year two, you could do it again. Another property and another property and another property. Or year two, I buy a business. I buy a small business, right? And that small business generates, uh, I put 50 grand in capital to get things started up. And maybe I start a little media company. And that media company generates $1,500 a month in cash flow, right? It can generate more, but it cash flows $1,500 a month after expenses. So that's $18,000 a year over 35 years. That's now 630 grand. So I got 210 over here, 630 grand over there. And maybe the company gets valued at one to $2 million. Uh, and then I can sell it to somebody for $1.5 million. So it generated me 630 grand in revenue in cash flow, I mean, over a 35 year period. And then maybe I sell it after 30 years for, I don't know, millions of dollars to someone else. Say 1.5, say two, say 2.5. So I get a cash out of two. Oh my goodness. So I'm solving for cash flow when I do infinite banking. Unfortunately, I see often on YouTube that IBC is sold as an income strategy, which it can. I mean, it's not like it doesn't work. I mean, I guess it works. Is it the most efficient thing? Eh, not in my opinion. It gets sold as an alternative to a 401k. That's going to be an argument till the end of times, right? Sold as an alternative to your um, bro investments accounts, brokerage accounts, and Roth IRAs, it's, uh, whatever, right? That's going to be an argument to the end of times. I'm not even playing that game. I'm, I'm in a totally different field here. I think there's a few guys that are promoting cash flow. You know, I think Garrett Gunderson, I think Caleb Gullums, IBC Global, you know, they just provide transparency. There's a few others. I think VIP Financial Education, they're all about cash flow, right? But I think that's different when you're dealing with the gurus because they have a whole ecosystem and, and whatnot going on. But oftentimes, a lot of you guys are not dealing maybe with the different gurus. Maybe you're dealing with a local, a local uh, agent in your town. Maybe you're dealing with a family member, right? So they may not know all of this, right? And then you go and watch a video. Now you're watching this video. You took all the time to watch this video over an hour long and you share it with the agent. If they're combative with you, Right. If they um, you know, don't listen to that kid or da, 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 whatever the case may be, 
Any type of negativity is a bit odd for me. At the end of the day, it's my 100 grand. Not your 100 grand, it's my $100,000. It's my 50 grand, it's my $5,000. Doesn't matter how much it is, it's mine. So if you deal with an agent that's combative with you and they're, they're shutting you down, they're not giving you all the details, they're not providing all the transparency, they're not pointing you to articles and resources and maybe other videos to watch, I would be wary because again, you have to deal with that agent for the next 30, 40, 50 years until death do us part. You gotta deal with them, right? It's not like you can just cut your agent out of your own policy, that's not how that works, right? So those are some things to think on. I'll turn the attention back to the board so you can take notes just one more time. I hope this was valuable to you. Again, I'm not trying to sell you on a particular company or a particular design or even, or even strategy. I'm just showing you what's on the board and I'm showing you what has worked for me. I saw for cash flow. I saw for minimum cost, maximum cash value. This is my blueprint. I personally have a policy with Mass and Guardian. I stay open minded. Maybe as I make more and more money, I'll get a policy with every single one of these companies just to see how they perform, right? And then do reviews on them. Right. I'm in my third approaching fourth year with Mass Mutual, third approaching fourth year with Guardian. So I'll have videos that shows the actual performance of these accounts based on the original illustration that was provided to me. Right. And I hope that's valuable for you. So have a wonderful day. I know this was very, very in depth. I have plenty of links in the description below. The same links apply in every one of my videos. You'll see a link specifically about ready to design your own high cash value life insurance policy. You'll get connected with IBC Global. That is who I got my policies designed with. I partner with them, Steve Parisi. Their team is amazing. Phil, Samantha, Brandon, the other Steve, Tim. I mean, you've got an entire, or Steven, not Tim, Steven. You've got an entire agent team that really knows what they're talking about. Stephanie an entire team that really knows what they're doing. Did I say Brandon? I think I said Brandon. Um, these are all the agents that I've communicated with personally, have some connections with, and their, their ethics, morals, values are really in alignment. And again, the IBC Global YouTube channel has so much content that just really specifically focuses on whole life insurance, WLI, high cash value, minimum premium design policies, and they, they just lay it all out, man. Uh, think of me, your personal finance geek, as a strategist. You know, I'm someone that you hire uh, to help you pay off bad debt, become debt leveraged, increase cash flow. We strategize, we have conversations, we determine your financial goals, we discover what it is, what your purpose is in life. You know, I have a whole seven year one on one coaching service, and I also have online courses, digital courses, and a community for you to engage with, right? So I want you to think of me as long-term person you work with, right? I'm not a, you know, hire and dump type of guy, long-term, right? Take me for the whole ride or not at all, right? That's kind of like how I like to operate. Take me for the whole ride or not, I'm all in or not at all. I don't, I don't like to do things half, right? Half cocked, I don't, I don't like that, right? I don't, I don't wanna, I wanna be very, very straight with you, right? So there's many different options in terms of how to work with me. I have many different resources. You may not even be ready for this, right? What's the pregame work? Go to my YouTube channel, go to playlist, and it'll say velocity banking pregame work, right? There's a playlist on all about the infinite banking concept, right? So give yourself the time before you jump in and drop 25 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand, or as little as five to 10 grand if you're a single mom trying to you know, make a better life for your kids, right? And you're trying to position yourself. Okay, you're a single mom or you're married, husband, wife, whatever it is, you're 40, 45 years old and you're just coming across this information now. You've been on planet Earth for 40 to 45 years, 50 years. Give yourself at least four to six months to immerse yourself into this type of material before you just drop money with any Joe Schmo, who's a licensed agent in your town. Really vet them, 
right? Um, essentially, you're, you're kind of like dating them, right? You're getting to know them, what they're about. So, you know, take the time. Anyways, I'm all done here. My name is Denzel Rodriguez, your personal finance geek of the 21st century. Have a wonderful day and God bless.